Every day we make hundreds of decisions, most of which are simply routine. But on the morning of December 4th, 1989 in Knoxville, Tennessee, Jerry Meredith and his wife Donna were on their way home from running errands when they faced a choice that was anything but ordinary. Much of the footage that follows was taped as events unfolded that day. Look at that guy down there. He's going nuts. I didn't understand what actually was, was going on at that time, but I thought there was you know, been an accident or the bank was being robbed. Look at that van right at the door. Look at, look at that van. And at that instant, this particular white van sped off. It's following. So I told my wife, let's just see where this, this here white van comes out, and we'll follow it. All of a sudden, a uh, black Ford Tempo sped out right in front of me. And then we look to the right, and there's the white van with the doors open. So then we knew the bank's been robbed, and the robbers, you know, have changed from the van to this black car. Realizing that I had my wife in the car, and it was dangerous, not just for myself, for her. I was trying to stay as far away as I could. No bullets go through metal doors, but uh, I felt that I have no use for a thief, period. I have no use for a thief. And if they had done this, they need to be brought to trial. I told my wife, don't even look at them, don't pay any attention to them. And we just drove right by them nonchalantly. He's my car up. Just enough so I could see this individual stuffing money into a bag. He was stuffing money into a sack as fast as he could. And all of a sudden, he stood straight up and looked in my direction. I would assume he didn't see me. I gave him maybe 20 seconds, 30 seconds. I started inching back up to watch, see what's going on. Well, at that time, a white Volvo pulled right back out onto the street and started heading back in the direction they had just come. The car is nothing to in the car there. Uh -huh. And I looked back into the parking lot where the Black Fort Temple was. It was empty, so I knew that they had to be in that white Volvo. Uh, they knew exactly what they were doing. Laid out perfect. Fast, really fast. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. That's, that's, that's where they're going. Oh, God, they know we're following him. Let's get out of here. So I immediately just stopped in my tracks, turned into a driveway, backed up and just nonchalantly hit it right back where I came from. Like nothing was happening, Sunday drive. But I knew in my mind, if I didn't get back to the bank as quick as I could, that these individuals could get away. Knoxville police officer Terry Clowers was investigating the robbery when Jerry pulled up. He was just driving just real wild and went to yelling at me. I was all the bank robbers, come and follow me, I'll show you where they're at. And I had to jump back in the car and chase him he was just real convincing. So I just told him over the radio, a subject was taking me to where the suspects were at. Stop him, Ray, follow him. Don't know, if you tell me to follow him. Uh, have all you to look out for a white Volvo in this area. Female driving, two white males in it. I got very nervous because they had moved the white Volvo out of the front of the house. Is this it? That's Go to the Red Cross Center and wait. You know, I got to thinking, this might be the wrong house. You know, he might have just followed somebody that was making a withdrawal. Hey, I see somebody looking out the window. But she was real frantic. And I said, well, you know, something's wrong here. People, you know, if they see a couple of cruisers in front, they might step out on the porch and say, what's going on, officer? You know, if, if nothing was going on. Where's he at, Terry? Officer Jim Marino, which we call Guido, arrived. Okay, move on up, go. Young officer, and I took him kind of under my wing. Got it. Okay. You're completely surrounded. You cannot escape. Come to the front door. Walk outside now. I informed them that uh, we were the police. They were completely surrounded. There was no means of escape. I told them to come out with their hands raised. No one would get hurt. Open the front door, walk outside. You're completely surrounded. You Officer Larry Gillum continued to talk to the suspects as an elderly woman living in an apartment behind the house was evacuated. Front door, 
Walk outside with your hands raised. Less than half an hour after they surrounded the house, a female suspect surrendered to police. Come to the front door. Come outside and onto the porch now. About 15 minutes later, the uh, first man of the group came out. is not bad. Tried the same thing again, but uh, no response for the third guy. It was the hard case. An FBI team arrived and took up positions around the house, including assistant special agent in charge, Tom Locke. One of the primary things we wanted to do was to find out as much intelligence information from the two who had surrendered about the third one who was still inside. Basically, there were two things. One, uh, he was armed. He had several weapons. And secondly, both the suspects thought that this individual was of a mind that he was not going to come out. Don't take the camera off my face, please. You tell me your buddy's name. I don't, I don't know his name. I don't, I don't know. know his name. You made me do this. We had determined that there was no telephone in the house. So that's when I pulled my car up and began talking to him through my loudspeaker. The Knoxville Police Department SWAT team took over at the scene, with the FBI supporting and Agent John Denton negotiating. What we try to do in this kind of situation is slow everything down. Get that person who's on the inside, whether they have hostages or not, to assess his situation in a realistic way. This is John Denton of the FBI. I'm a negotiator. I want you to relax. Take it easy. This is the problem with this incident. There's no phone in the house. With a bullhorn, you really can't tell with the dynamics whether the person is actually tuned into you. He's been through a bank robbery, so he's, he's very high uh, on anxiety. Uh, he's fired up. His adrenaline's pumping. Uh, he thought he was safe. Suddenly he realized he's surrounded by the police. He's got weapons in there. He's got a lot of bank robbery loot. Uh, two people, probably in his mind, and I'm second guessing here, have abandoned him. And there he is, stuck. At this time, we could see the suspect move through the house. I asked the lieutenant permission to take him out if I see him come by the window again. He said, fire and defense only. The SWAT team commander, Lieutenant Jim Kennedy, was in charge at the scene. He was caught up, trapped, had no place to go. And it was his choice to either come out dead or alive. One of the sharpshooters on the scene was Officer Gary Moyers. We figured that a rational person would see that the uselessness of the situation and, and come out. If not, we would deplore some gas and force him out into us. As the standoff entered its third hour, tear gas rounds were launched into the house. Normally, whenever a person is exposed to gas, it's, it's a, a shock effect. You know, uh, I give up, I give up, but it didn't happen. Didn't happen. <laughs> and we poured some more gas in attempt to enhance the effects it was having on him. And he, he still refused to come out. When he started firing, he just took out all the glass. So he had a big hole, and he was getting fresh air in on him. Guido yelled at me, Terry, I've been hit. Oh, he was just telling me, Terry, it burns, it burns. It's just real scary. I didn't know if he had his stomach blown away.
Guido and I were real close, and, and uh, it scared me real bad. And I crawled up alongside him, pulled out the microphone, and said, I think we've all had enough of, of this. Why don't you throw out your gun? And almost immediately, uh, a gun came out the window. Very positive sign. Oh, he's still got two weapons. It's like a kid throwing a tantrum. Once the energy's dissipated, you've got, at least for the time being, someone you can deal with. Talked him out on the front porch. Had the weapon on his own chest. Given the peace sign. So, in effect, he's holding himself hostage for his own safety. If he came out of there in any other posture, with the emotions out there, with an officer being shot, and all the other gunfire that went on, cruisers being damaged, bullets, holes, and things, uh, somebody on the perimeter might have shot him. He told us that he was going to, uh, to, going to kill himself. He said, don't get excited, don't be alarmed. He said, there's gonna be one more shot. He said, that's all there is to it. He said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end this. I'm gonna take my own life. I'm gonna kill myself. And we said, no, don't. We kept trying to get him to throw the gun out. And uh, the FBI agent was there with me. I, I looked and I said, I can hit the gun. He says, what? I said, I can shoot the gun. It knocked it up away from his chest. And he turned and, and turned the pistol and looked at it and saw that it was damaged. After four hours, the final suspect was taken into custody. He was later found guilty of bank robbery and attempted murder and sentenced to prison. The other male suspect was also sentenced to prison. The woman was cleared of all charges. Jerry Meredith has received numerous awards for his quick thinking in spotting the bank robbers that day. Had he not uh, followed them and observed the car switching and then uh, taken us to that location, we probably wouldn't have caught them. Because he'd been wearing a bulletproof vest, Officer Richard Giamarino recovered quickly from the gunshot. The vest absorbs the energy of the bullet, but the bullet is moving at such a fast rate that it actually burns you. It's like being hit with a baseball bat or a, or a hot poker. Guido's living proof of wearing the body armor and a lot of officers that normally left that vest hanging in their, their locker now put it on. <laughs>